Alice Slater is on the board of World Beyond War and longtime anti-nuclear activist, campaigned with ICANN, uh, the Nobel Prize winning international campaign for the abolition of nuclear weapons, which successfully organized negotiations at the UN for the new treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. She won a Nobel Peace Prize, folks. Um, Alice, me and a thousand other people. Alice will give the background uh, uh, of the, this resolution and hopes to get the New York City Council to pass this legislation, which calls on the U.S. government to join the new treaty and ban the bomb. Welcome, Alice. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> So maybe I, what should I just tell just them? Hold yeah. um, one place. <laughs> well, I want to tell you about the Nobel Peace Prize because it's so spectacular. We had a 10-year campaign all over the world. It was like in uh, 120 countries with 500 organizations getting governments to negotiate a treaty at the United Nations. It happened two years ago that said nuclear weapons are illegal, they're prohibited, you can't have them, you can't use them, you can't threaten to use them, you can't share them. We don't have anything like that. We've banned biological and chemical weapons, we banned landmines and cluster bombs, but nuclear weapons is this very special case. In 1970, five countries, the US, Russia, England, France, and China agreed to give up their nuclear weapons if the rest of the world promised not to get them. This was the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And everybody agreed to sign except three countries, India, Pakistan, Israel. They didn't agree, so they got bombs. So they joined the other five. And this treaty had a Faustian bargain that if you promise not to get nuclear weapons and you sign and you join us, we will give you an inalienable right to peaceful nuclear power. So we gave them the keys to the bomb factory because how do you make a bomb? You need a nuclear reactor. You can't hide that in the basement like chemical. You need a huge reactor. North Korea got their peaceful power, walked out and made a bomb. We were afraid Iran was doing that, but they said they weren't. You know, they were just <coughs> enriching uranium for peaceful purposes. And so we never really banned the bomb. You know, we didn't ban it. There's this loophole, and over the years, we've been perfecting and doing more weapons. Even though we got rid of a lot of them, we're still making new ones. It's impossible. So at the last non-proliferation tree review conference in 20, was it, no, not the last one, but in, 20, yeah, in 2015, they have a five-year <coughs> review. South Africa said this is like nuclear apartheid. The nuclear weapon states are holding the rest of the world hostage with their nuclear bombs, and we're going to work on this ban treaty. And it went through a bunch of proposals. Norway had a meeting, and then Austria had a meeting in Mexico, and it got to the UN, and they agreed to negotiate, and we got it. We got the treaty. Now, the five nuclear Down has got it. We're OK. So the five nuclear weapon states, and for us, our NATO alliance, and the three Asian countries, or the Pacific countries, Australia, South Korea, and Japan, they're under our nuclear umbrella. We called them the weasel states. They, they didn't participate in the meeting. They, you know, they said, it's wrong. We don't need this treaty. We have the other treaty. And as a matter of fact, the only country that came was the Netherlands. They came to the negotiations because the parliament had grassroots pressure and said, we want to be at those negotiations. So they came, they voted no, but at least they were there. Nobody else was even there. So now, we get the treaty. A year later, we win the Nobel Peace Prize for this wonderful accomplishment. And this was, I tell you, my personal story, my 
daughter lives in California, was staying with me in New York, and the phone rings at 5.30 in the morning. This was like in uh, uh, November or October of 1918. That was the year we won it. And the phone rings 5.30 in the morning, and I get up. It's my friend from Australia. He's with the International Physicians of Prevention of Nuclear War, and he was like the head of the committee that was organizing the campaign. And he and his wife had stayed with me when we were negotiating at the UN, so we really got friendly. He said, Alice, we won the Nobel Peace Prize. And I start screaming, and my daughter comes and she said, Mom, who's calling so early, and why are you screaming? <laughs> I said, we won the Nobel Peace Prize. And now she's screaming. She says, she said, you have to go to us. I said, no, it's too cold, it's too dark, I'm too old. She said, I'll go with you. And she did. She went with me. And I wound up writing it up for the nation. It was very wonderful. And the prize was accepted by the young woman who was executive director, Beatrice Finn. She's from Sweden. During this campaign, she actually had a baby. And then the other woman was an 82-year-old survivor of Hiroshima, Setsuko Thurlow, who was 15 years old and survived the bomb, wound up going to Canada, became a sociologist, very articulate, and was speaking at all our UME. So these two women took the prize, all of us. Anyway, so now what are we going to do about the weasel states and the nuclear states? So this ICANN campaign, the international campaign, to abolish nuclear weapons has a cities campaign. So in the nuclear weapon states, we're getting cities and states like Paris signed and uh, <coughs> Sydney, Australia. So this is New York. You know, we we got it. We got it through the council. We have a. It didn't get voted yet, but there's a um, there's a hearing next the 20, 28th. 28th of January. 12 o'clock at City Hall, there's a press conference on the steps. 1 o'clock's a hearing. Anybody can come and testify. You just put your name in, and you can talk or certainly come and support us and tell your friends. Don is going to testify. I was asked by Clearwater to, test to represent Clearwater to testify. Well, the committee has been trying to get, you know, like Helen Caldecott sent a letter. She couldn't be here. You know, we're trying to get impressive people and do press and show, listen, it's New York. If we can make it here, we'll make it anywhere, right? I mean, we're going to take this step forward. And the resolutions that we're passing, there are two. One's a law and one's a resolution. One asks the city council to call on the United States government to join the ban treaty. And the other, and part of that is to divest, have the New York City pensions divested from all nuclear weapons manufacturers. And then there's a separate law that's unique to New York. I'm learning about this, even all my years as a nuclear activist. You know, they didn't name it the Manhattan Project for nothing. Mm -hmm. And we literally have radioactive sites in New York where they were doing experiments to make the bomb. You know, they had stuff in Staten Island they were doing, and, and up at Columbia. Well, and was the, was the so, base. Right. Anyway, there's a report one of our people did on the, the science of what was going on here. So they agreed to set up a New York City commission to examine. I remember we had the nuclear freeze in Central Park, and we had the home port group where we didn't allow any missiles to come in with bombs near New York. These were all grassroots, you know, citizen action. So we're coming into another role next week. I hope you'll all be there. We're getting the city to pass this. We think it'll pass because we have a, a super majority that already sponsored. This is so funny, like when we were starting it, we were getting a letter to the controller. One of the, the head of the finance committee, Daniel Drum, he's one of the big leaders on this at the council, said, get me 20 people to sign this letter and I'll go forward with it. So I called my city councilman. They told me he was out on paternity leave. He was having his first child, Ben Callos. I live on the Upper East Side. So I wrote him a long letter saying how wonderful that you're having your first child <laughs> and what a gift you can give your child if New York says we should get rid of nuclear weapons. And he signed on. I mean, like, it was easy. I didn't even have to 
talk to the guy. I just wrote a letter. <laughs> so anyway. And then Cal has been very, very positive in the environment. Oh, yeah, area. he's wonderful. And he took a big lead in this, you know. He, he'll be at the press conference. There'll be a couple, that uh, woman on the Upper West Side, Helen Rosenthal, will be at the press conference, and Daniel Drum. And I'm still working to get a Lenape person here because we did a meeting on Fukushima about five years ago, and we had people from the Diné tribe, which we used to call the Navajos, but they're not the Navajos anymore because that's a Spanish word for knife. So now they're the Diné, and they had all this uranium mining killing them, and the guy got up and he excoriated us at this meeting. It was up in the on Amsterdam in 87th, the, the, it's a social hall that does left-wing cause, because we didn't have an indigenous person to welcome people to the meeting. So I said, you know, I'm a born and bred New York. I said, I didn't even know we had indigenous people. He says, the Lenape. So I Googled it, and there's a Lenape Center, and I met a Lenape guy, and he gave us a statement for our nonproliferation meeting. And I, he, I can't get all of them now, but we're trying to get this other Lenape, Ramapo, and I, but I we need somebody by next week uh -huh. to come. We have this Chief Dwayne. Do you know him? No. He's yeah. um, I think it's very important to remember for some people who are not from Manhattan, Lenape means the people. And when they named the incendiary revolutionary group that took over a fire station about um, 43 <coughs> years ago and held it open throughout the Bean and Koch administrations, and it was held open for another 25 years, instead of just calling it a firehouse, they called it the People's Firehouse, mainly because the settlers in that area were the Lenape Indian, which translates directly into English meaning the, the people. people. Yeah. Well, anyway, I mean, if not forget that. if you go on their loves, loves, uh, website, you know, they deny that they ever sold Manhattan for $24 to the Dutch, which is what we're always being, they said it wasn't theirs to sell. They didn't have land. They yeah, couldn't they, sell. They, they, yeah. don't they don't the believe land. they could own it, so how could they sell? Yeah. Anyway, I, to the land, the I, wa I wanted to shift a little. I mean, we know about this campaign. We know it's going all over the world. There was great news today. There, the U.S. keeps nuclear weapons in five NATO states. We keep nuclear weapons in Germany, Belgium, Holland, Turkey, and Italy. And the ban treaty, which is stigmatizing the bombs, saying they're illegal, you can't have them, there's like a lot of grassroots action going on. So today on the internet, Belgium, the, the parliament, the vote was very close. We lost, but there was a vote to get the U.S. nukes out of Belgium because the people, are, you know, nobody even knew they were there, but because of the ban treaty, we're becoming aware of where this stuff is. So I'm looking, though, yes, what? what? Because of? The ban treaty that, okay. you know, that it, it got passed and there's publicity and we're bothering everybody, we're lobbying, we're doing it now in New York. I hope we'll all go back up to New York State and get it through the Albany legislature, because California has put it through their state <coughs> legislature and L.A. We're just starting here in New York. We have to go upstate, too. Yes? Is there, <coughs> is there any reason to believe that it won't pass in New York? No. There's a supermajority that signed and sponsored. But they're not, uh, not going to vote when we're there. They, it goes back into committee after they hear all the testimony. I don't know. But I, I have no reason to think it wouldn't pass. And part of, um, part of the testimony uh, that uh, Clearwater has asked me to do, although I'll be doing it as a board member of Clearwater rather than speaking for Clearwater, just to be kosher, um, the um, Clearwater doesn't have a particular stance on nuclear weapons, but Clearwater has a big stance on nuclear energy and Indian Point and decommissioning. And there are obviously uh, issues that concern. Well, I, I described one, that, the one, link. One of the yeah. big ones is waste, all right? And uh, the fact that every country that brought on in nuclear energy were basically 
bomb factories. They were creating the fission material for bombs. That's the hardest what part. And they were also concerned with waste uh, uh, storage. And they were also concerned with uh, uh, the fact that, as Bob Alpern said, these are sitting targets. How did he say it? Well, no. Uh, he said, hold on, he said they are pre-positioned nuclear weapons. So each, each nuclear facility is a danger. Well, Al Qaeda, it was on the front page of the Times when they knocked down the World Trade Center that they were considering Indian Point, which is 25 miles from the Bronx. I mean, we would have had Fukushima on the Hudson. Would have, we would have been, the city would have been uninhabitable. We're really lucky that they didn't do right. that. Yeah. So well, there's some communities that are impacted are the First Nations in New Mexico, Texas, and Nevada for weapons testing, uranium mining, and milling and proposed waste storage. Nuclear is not just about the plant, the bomb. There's so many things. It's the mining. It yeah. Up until that point. Uh, indigenous communities in, those, in the south southwest are being seriously impacted for life by their uh, their land and their water and their air being uh, polluted <laughs> with radioactivity. So these are the kind of things that and that uh, in my testimony to great. The, uh, you know, they're also trying to get rid of it by burying it on Shoshone, Western Shoshone Holy Land in Nevada, Yucca Mountain. And the stuff is toxic for 300,000 years. I mean, just think of that number, all of recorded history, it's 5,000 years. How can we even make one more drop of it, you know? And now you have the nuclear industry, you know, greenwashing nuclear power, saying it doesn't create carbon. Well, I was down in Portsmouth, Ohio. Well, no, it burns. The radiation doesn't create calm. But I was in Portsmouth, Ohio, where they were enriching the uranium for the reactor, and it was hooked up to a coal plant. I mean, the milling, the mining, the moving, the, the construction, you have to have all uses. To keep the, uh, the, the waste cool. You have, if you yeah. don't have electricity, it's going to blow. Right. Well, the, the really ugly thing is that Indian Point, our local hazard, like less than a mile, there's a gas pipe running underground near it. I mean, we really, we have our work cut out for us. It's great that we took back the, uh, the state, you know, we had that IDC that was referred to, and they're gone, but Cuomo's still a son of a gun. You know, I mean, we really have to move much more swiftly on no gas, no fracking, no, they're giving, they're closing any point, but they're going to give like $8.6 billion in subsidies to four upstate nuclear power plants. You could put a solar roof on every house in New York for that, you know, and I mean. on all our uh, electric bills. Yeah, so the other thing we have to do is take back Con Edison and make it a public utility. It should, because it's private, it's pushing gas and nuclear because it makes money on that. So we have to own, we used to own it, you know. This is what happened with Reagan and Clinton and Obama, they all, and then we wound up with Trump. There's one other issue that I haven't discussed that I think is very important. Because we have everything in place, right? But how are we going to get people to really want to get rid of nuclear weapons if they're so terrified of Russia. And we're hearing one horrible Russian story after another. I mean, we're, we're in the second Red Scare. I remember growing up in the 50s, I went to Queens College in 1954. I was having a discussion with somebody in the cafeteria. She said, here, you should read this. She gave me this little pamphlet, and I look at it, it says, Communist Party of America. I was terrified. My heart was pounding. I, I put in my book bag. I went home. I went up to the eighth floor. I walked directly to the incinerator and threw it down the incinerator without even reading it. That's how scared we were. And they're doing it all over again. You know, I mean, they're saying Hillary won because Russia interfered with our elect. Give me a break, you know. So uh, I want to tell you how Russia has been totally on our side all the way through. The latest news is that Putin's announcing this horrible hypersonic missile that they're scaring you with. 
So he is, I just want to give you my history that I studied. In 1946, and even before I didn't even have this one, Woodrow Wilson sent troops to St. Petersburg in 1918 to help the white Russians against the, the communist revolution. That was before Stalin. That was just like capitalism wasn't going to stand for it. Then, and you know, those were the, the peasants that were overthrowing the Tsar. You know, what were we doing there in that time? Then in 1946, Stalin said to Truman, they, they formed the United Nations to end the scourge of war. I'll, I'll get back to you. Let me just finish this. To end the scourge of war, Russia lost, I found this out later, 27 million, million people to the Nazi onslaught. I mean, we talk about, as a Jew, our six million, you know, 27 million. We lost 3,000 in the World Trade Center. We turned the whole world upside down, you know. And here they are with 27 million. So anyway, he said, Stalin, to Truman, turn the bomb over to UN control, this horrible weapon that was used, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Truman said no. So Russia got their own bomb. Then Reagan rejected Gorbachev's offer. I mean, Gorbachev let go of all of Eastern Europe without a shot. He ended the Soviet occupation. The wall came down. It was like a miracle. And he said to Reagan, they met in Reykjavik, let's get rid of our nuclear weapons. Reagan says, good idea. So Gorbachev says, but don't do Star Wars. Because in our Star Wars Vision 2020, it says, the mission is U.S. Space Command dominating and controlling the military use of space <coughs> to protect U.S. interests and investments. I should have brought it just to show you. So Reagan says, I'm not giving up Star Wars. So that was the end of that. Then he, Reagan was, uh, Gorbachev was very concerned if Germany was reunited when the war came down that he didn't want them in NATO because they had done such damage during the war. And Reagan said, don't worry, let Germany be reunited, let them come into NATO, and we give you our word, we will not expand NATO one inch to the east. And Jack Matlock, who was Russia's, our ambassador to Russia wrote an op-ed piece about this in the New York Times. And now NATO is right up to Russia's border, we're doing military maneuvers. I mean, look what happened when they put stuff in Cuba. We went bananas, you know. We almost started World War III at that time. And part of the deal that Kennedy made to get the missiles out of Cuba, we d he didn't tell anybody because the Congress would not have let him make that deal, but we got our missiles out of Turkey a year later that we had put in there. And now they're back with missiles. And that's right on Russia's border, you know. So anyway, Putin said to Clinton, let's cut to a thousand and call everybody at the table and negotiate, but don't put missiles in Romania. We were starting to violate the anti-ballistic missile treaty that we had with the Soviet Union. Clinton says, I can't do that. And then Reagan gets elected and walks out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty, right? Even later, Put Putin, or first of all, Russia and China keep putting a model treaty in the UN. They did it in 2006 and 2014 or 2008 to keep weapons out of space. And it's at this UN committee in Geneva where you need consensus to, to discuss something. US blocks, we won't even talk about it. And then the last horrible thing that we did, Putin called Obama and said, let's negotiate a treaty to ban cyber war because we had attacked Iranian enrichment facilities with a computer hack, you know, and where everybody's scared, anybody, this is not like a nuclear bomb, anybody can hack you with a computer. U.S. turned him down. And then, you know, recently we walked out of the INF, we're establishing a space force. So how are we going to de de demonize Russia so that Americans won't be afraid, you know, to, to know that there is an opportunity there, that they're open to us. Yeah. There was a very specific, huge de-demonizing of Russia before World War II. 
when Lenin was in power initially for a little bit of time. In 1931, it's, it's a new book that came out. It's called The Russian Job. And it basically shows how our president, one of the scoundrels of the American history of the 20th century, Herbert Hoover, basically created something called um, uh, the I, I think it's, no, American Relief Authority, or ARA. ARA basically fed, gave food to Russia for millions of people over 10 million square, no, 10 million people over a million square mile rate, um, area of land in Russia. Otherwise, the World War II um, horror of the 25 million that you said were lost during World War II, and then there were more lost during the But that's, you said 30, you're talking yes, about the, 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 yes, but, but that's before is, World War II. Right, yeah. I know that, but what I'm saying is the horror that you talked about might have been dwarfed by the starvation that could have taken place that was prevented by our country. So I'm glad we did something good. So, so, so <laughs> in reality, in reality, the relationship, yes, there are leaders who have you know, their own characteristics, but the relationship between Russia and the United States isn't always the Cold War and the bitter enemies that are seen. And Hoover was no saint. He allowed Americans to starve on the White House lawn. And, and essentially, he did do something really, really important by setting up initially, not 1918, but 13 years later, initially there was, when Russia changed its government, there was a, a combination of that government. Yeah, but people I get it. But I'll tell you one thing. When, when, when Yeltsin came in, Clinton, when he took such advantage, I mean, instead of coming in with a Marshall Plan, they were changing their system from communism to capitalism, we just sucked up all their resources, all our rich guys took all the minerals and whatever, whatever the wealth we could take out of it. Their life expectancy dropped in Russia to like 56 or something. Like I just read this week that it's up to 73. That's why they love Putin because, you know, he's, he's feeding them, he's taking care of them. You know, however bad he is, he's, but their life expectancy is coming back. I mean, we, we did not do well. We did not do the honorable thing. And um, it's just something to realize if we really want to get rid of nuclear weapons, we're going to have to talk with them because there's 15,000 on the planet and 14,000 are in the U.S. and Russia. I don't know if I said that. All the other countries, you know, India, Pakistan, China, England, France, North Korea, they have a thousand between them. So if these two big gorillas on the block can't agree, nobody else is going to agree. Yeah. Alice, what, what, what's China's role in this? Because I know they, um, the head of, of their parli parliament recently came out saying that they expect the U.S. to curtail their uh, nuclear weapons. Yeah, China is, China's been the, the wise man on the block. They never made more than 100 bombs. I mean, the U.S. and Russia, at one point, we had 70,000 nuclear weapons. We're down to 15,000, which is good because it showed we were able to cut them and investigate and verify. Nobody did it on their honor. They did it by inspections and verification, and we did that. So we know how to get rid of them. We know how to check each other, where they are, and what's happening. China never got into it, and Trump is giving us baloney that he's not going to make a deal unless China gets. It's ridiculous. China has a couple of hundred nuclear bombs, and us and Russia have. 7,000 each, including we have 2,500 armed missiles targeting all our cities and their cities. They're and having ended the Cold War? No. Yeah. The Cold War uh, yeah. agreement. They have missiles today facing us, and we have missiles facing us. Right, but they, uh, Bush walked out of that treaty. That said you couldn't put the anti-missiles. They could each only have one anti-missile system, so uh, Moscow had one and we had one in North Dakota at our uh, uh, missile base. Now Bush walked out of it, so we're putting these systems into Romania, Poland, you know, this is threatening Russia. I wanted to, if you have patience, I want to read you what Putin said and, in March. And, and, and March. A little, a little announcement be, between that, we really want to encourage people to come to the New York City Council oh, yeah. meeting on January 28th.
12 o'clock is the press conference. 12. And uh, to get, if you, is anybody interested in, in submitting a, um, a statement, then we'll give you the information to do that. Um, but it and you can even do the statement when you get there. You can sign up and they give you two minutes to speak, anybody. And if you have anything written, you can hand it in at that point. But I just want to read what Rush had to say. In March 2018, Putin gave his State of the Nation speech. And he's, this is Putin. I will speak about the newest system of Russian strategic weapons that we are creating in response to the unilateral withdrawal of the United States of America from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty and the practical deployment of their missile defense systems both in the U.S. and beyond their national borders. This is Romania and Poland. I would like to make a short journey into the recent past. Back in 2000, the U.S. announced its withdrawal from the ABM Treaty. Russia was categorically against this. We saw the Soviet-U.S. ABM Treaty signed in 1972 as the cornerstone of the international security system. Under this treaty, the parties had the right to deploy ballistic missile defense systems only in one of its regions. Russia deployed these around Moscow and the U.S. around its Grand Forks land-based ICM base. Together with the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, that's the one Trump is thinking of walking out now, coming up, the ABM Treaty not only created an atmosphere of trust, but also prevented either party from recklessly using nuclear weapons, which would have endangered humankind because a limited number of ballistic missile defense systems made the potential aggressor vulnerable to responsive strike. We did our best to dissuade the Americans from withdrawing from the treaty, all in vain. The U.S. pulled out of the treaty in 2002. Even after that, we tried to develop constructive dialogue with the Americans. We proposed working together in this area to ease concerns and maintain the atmosphere of trust. At one point, I thought that a compromise was possible, but this was not to be. All our proposals, absolutely all of them were rejected. And then we said that we would have to improve our modern strike systems to protect our security. And they did. And that's what we complain about. Oh, look what they're doing. And we provoked it. I, I keep thinking of Walt Kelly's comic strip Pogo in the 50s. You know, the Red Scare time. He's, he says, we met the enemy and he is us. So it's really up to us. And New York starting, if we can do it here, we'll do it anywhere. So from New York to the world, I hope. Thank you.